You're listening to The Valley Current. So thank you guys for coming, and thank you for being on Zoom. My name is Jack Russo. I'm the chairman and CEO of a nonprofit foundation that sort of came up with the idea with Dr. Walter Bortz, who's here, and whose birthday, his 92nd birthday is shortly, and we have some birthday cake, and we're gonna sing happy birthday at the end. But we have some real expertise in the room. The Foundation for Creativity and Dispute Resolution is all about trying to figure out the future of law and litigation, and how it can move from the current model to a new model. And by analogy, I think medicine is moving to a different new model. And we talk about the purpose of medicine, I'm quoting now Dr. Walter Bortz, is to actually assist human potential to its fullest. How do you pull it, how do you put it, Wally? The assertion and assurance of the human potential. The assertion and assurance of everyone's human potential. So moving away from the repair model. So we fund and have funded this course. We hopefully, we hopefully provide enough funds that you get enough food out of the lunch. And I, I'm gonna break this up into three parts. So one part, I'm gonna give you a few background slides about how I think about this topic. And then I'm gonna provide you with feedback from the survey that you did. Hopefully you'll see some of that survey data about what our folks' expectations about lifespan versus health span versus work span versus money is needed for what might be called retirement or play span, although that's not a word that's used. And then the third part is we'll open it up to the questions because we have also a person that should be getting a Nobel Prize soon, I keep saying this to you, Dr. Leonard Hayflick, who discovered the Hayflick limit. You can go on Wikipedia, their publications are all there. I think Wally has over 100, Leonard has over 100. Leonard has discovered something very famous. Now, this is also funded by my law firm, Computer Law Group. There's a business firm called Entrepreneur Law Group. There's a venture capital firm called Florence Ventures. Uh, we really want to move the needle on what the future looks like for both law and medicine. This concept of healthy 100 years is this mission to imagine what Dr. Bortz is saying is really the purpose of medicine, which is this idea of making sure human potential will be extended, will continue to occur. Now, I can't say I sat through all of the classes. Last year we did it by Zoom, so I sat through more of them. Some of you may remember some of these, some of you may not. These are different lectures that talk about different elements of a healthy 100-year lifestyle. Obviously, diet is part of it. Obviously, mindfulness is part of it. Self-compassion is part of it. How you look at the world. Some people look at the current events that are happening in the Ukraine, they think the world is ending. Other people look at them and say, this is the beginning of the end for communism or the beginning of the end of Russia as a, a threatening state. We'll see where it goes. What we can all say across the board is the most precious thing we have is time, and it marches on. It just goes in one direction. It doesn't necessarily go backwards. Lawyers, of course, charge by the hour. Some say we charge by the grain of time as we pass. And the hours mount up, but there really aren't that many hours of waking, conscious time over the course of 100 years. You can do the math and do some calculations as to what that is. And I like to say, and I've used this before, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, that all of us have and hope to have a healthy seven essences. If you break apart what we do, we build HQ, our health quotient. Hopefully we are and we choose people to be with that are sane and sober. We build our IQ, that's what you do at a university. You hopefully become and associate with people that are smart and savvy. Those pairs are meant to cover both the intellectual side as well as what we call the practical side. EQ, emotional intelligence, sensitive and supportive. I can go through all of these, but the concept is we build these over time. And eventually we go from someone that looks like this 
This was my first year of law school, literally my first adult bank account. Back then, they finally were moving to a card in Santa Monica. I went to UCLA Law School, and that's what I looked like back then. That's my aim. I've been losing weight during the pandemic. I have been either doing yoga or biking or swimming or all three for at least an hour a day, every day consistently, nonstop. So that's been about 700 plus days, if we say the pandemic has been roughly 700 plus days. So I've lost about 50 pounds. I'm gonna show you some of the data, which is interesting. And this goal is really over time, different things that we get are delivered to us easily. So our physiological needs are met. Our safety needs are usually met. Our belonging and love needs hopefully are met. And we're heading towards what does it mean to be self-actualized or what does it mean to have human potential reach the optimum? So that we have just about 100 years to do it if we live a healthy life. Now, some of you think it's less than that. I can tell you from the survey data. Some of you think you won't live beyond 80. Some of you think you'll make it between 80 and 90. Most people don't think they're getting above 90. Both of these gentlemen are above 90. And they're gonna tell us because they're both, they both survived their spouses of many decades, single marriage relationships. They both live on their own, in your own houses, being able to drive their own cars at over 90 years. That's quite a statement in a way. And without any mechanical devices running in the house to support you, which I can't say was true for, for my mom when she died, which I'll tell you that story. So you can break a healthy 100 years into kind of three groups. One, of course, is sleep. Maybe if you're lucky, you spend eight hours a night in sleep. Most people don't. I think most people in medical school or law school don't. Uh, the other third is just like daily life, brushing your teeth, using the bathroom, other stuff that you have to do, buying groceries. And then the rest of it is really, if you're lucky, thinking. Now, I don't know how much of your workday is thinking, but we are fundamentally knowledge workers. I mean, I started my life at age six working in my dad's grocery store in Brooklyn, New York, moving cases of tomato soup, Campbell's tomato soup, from the basement to the shelves and stamping them with the stamp because there was no computer that scanned the barcode. You stamp each can with the price and you change the price. So there was hardly any thinking in that, but over time, as you become more of an intellectual, as you go to more school, as you become more educated, and thinking, of course, itself can be broken into very many categories, like you know, seeking information, forming concepts, looking for a file that you can't find, and you're pulling your hair out trying to find it. We've all been through that. So this healthy 100 years, if you're lucky, is maybe less than a million hours, all things considered. And it should be at least 40 years of leadership or thinking like a leader if you excel in what you do. And in fact, most of you think your work spans will be more like 60 years based on the data, which was surprising because usually, historically, I've seen those numbers shrink, but maybe now post-pandemic, people think they have to sort of go much further. So there's more detail on these slides about what's health quotient and what does it mean to get to this length of time where you actually have lived a long life. Now this gentleman, World War II veteran, 112th birthday on Friday, May 11th of last year, so if he's still alive, he's going on 113. He, he smokes, he drinks, he enjoys life. This was America's oldest man, according to that news report. He doesn't match Marie Kalma, who we think made it to 122. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. But I do want to say that as a general proposition, people are living longer. Now, are they actually extending their health span as well? In many ways, the lifestyle course is all about how can we make health span match your actual lifespan? So instead of the decline being a decline where you basically have lots of loss over time, it's like the lights go out at 112, or the lights go out at 122, or the lights go out at even 90, 
but without what I would call the suffering. And I just want to spend a minute, and hopefully this will work. I'm going to change the computer over to the lectern model because I want to show you some pictures of what I've been doing. So uh, I dedicated last year's wrap-up class, which was about March of last year, so we were one year into the pandemic, to Wally's father. And I put this image up saying I dedicate the presentation. So this one, Wally, I'm dedicating to you and Len Hayflick because you guys made it here today, came from your homes, were very mobile getting here, and basically said you want to be part of this class because we're going to have a question and answer and go through. How do you guys do it? But I do want to explain that you know Edward Bortz wrote one of the earliest treatises about what he called creative aging. Just happens to be a coincidental overlap with the foundation of creativity and dispute resolution because I think law is becoming a creative solution type of approach. And I think that aging and creative aging is what many medical doctors who aren't just gerontologists will end up doing. And your dad was the head of the American Medical Association and had lots of publications and was very successful. But he only lived, if I recall, to about age 75. 74. So even though he was the master of the subject, he didn't, as we think about it, probably you thought he lived at the time a pretty lengthy life. But today, you wouldn't say that. Today, what you would say, he lost out on about 25% of his life. You'd say he should have made it to a healthy 100 years, just like you're on the march to the healthy 100 years. And you're already planning your 100th birthday, as is Len, as we speak. So he writes a book that talks about what does it mean to talk about creative aging. And of course, there's Wally as a marathon runner right up through your 86th birthday. Did I get the data right? Or longer? It's right through 86. Was that your last marathon, Wally, the Boston, Boston Marathon? Day? Boston Marathon with the bombs going off. You know, the guy was just convicted and the U.S. Supreme Court just affirmed that he basically can be executed, quite a statement. But that's Wally wearing the computer law group sweatshirt <laughs> out there running. And I want to go to my mom for a minute because I do want to contrast. So that's my mom on her wedding day 71 years ago. 1951, April of 1951, they would have been married if they both were alive, but they're now both deceased. 71 years, that's quite a statement in a way. And that's my dad, died about five years early at the age of 90, he was about five years different to my mom. And that's me as a young, their first uh, son with a little bow tie on, maybe they knew I was gonna be a lawyer. And that's my lovely wife, Dr. Lee Sear, who's here, and thank you for being here. And that's my eldest daughter, who's now had her own two children, two daughters. So this is the reproduction aspect playing itself out. And that's sort of the extended family with my other daughter and her husband. Uh, so that's Danielle and Amory, and Amory's in the back with a big smile on top of Lee and her husband. And back all the way in the corner is her son. And that's her daughter, Amory's daughter, uh, Ploma. And that's me with my mom, and at that time, Anne-Marie's two kids, uh, Massimo and Paloma, when Paloma was maybe about six months old or less, and that's the two of them. So just to give you some background, but last year, we moved to Florida. Actually, it's probably two years, two years ago. Years. So at the time, my brother had gotten sick, not COVID. He, there's a story, but I won't spend much time on it. And my mom just completely fell apart over my youngest brother's eventual death. And my brother should have lived far beyond his death at age 64, but he didn't. And of course, he smoked about two million Marlboro cigarettes over the course of his 50 years of, quote, adulthood from age 14. It wasn't really quite an adult. But this is my mom would routinely call the uh, 911 service because she felt that she had a loss of breath or something. And they send a troop of people out from the Tampa Fire Department. I don't know, we would see this like every other month. She had her own cell phone. She, even, day. she would basically <laughs> say, it's time for me to leave. And that's my brother. My brother was essentially uh, in hospice for about six months period of time on that order of time. 
and that's all of us visiting with him sort of on his final few weeks of life he chose not to do any type of cancer treatments basically said i'm just going to accept hospice at the age of 64. that's my mom towards the end getting a lot of support from a hospital that's what it looks like to watch this over time that's what it looks like to watch your younger brother over time and that was a big motivator for me to start losing weight a really big motivator watching the demise of people that you remember as very youthful very uh, strong individuals and watching that deterioration over time so this is me in the yoga class which is a couple of years ago and you could see that I'm still pretty fat in that picture of course I'm not exactly thin now but I'm heading in the right direction and this goal was to keep challenging yourself and to stay out of anxiety as well as out of boredom by growing skill in yoga, in swimming, in biking, and extending yourself. And so that's kind of a little backgrounder to this watchful period over the period of COVID, watching relatives come to the end of life, watching how they come to the end of life, and saying, I don't want to get to the end of life in the same way. So hopefully everyone has been able to see this. I don't know if they have, I don't know, are we sharing? Are we able, is it actually going to the shared screen? It's going there? Okay, so we're able to see it, okay, good. So conceptually, um, I was marking a blackboard with each yoga session. So every day in the yoga studio, this is a big motivator, by the way. If you actually show publicly what you're doing to the rest of the people in the room and mark, you know, strike by strike as you go along, they expect to see that. Like, they basically push you to see that. For, so, so if anyone wants to learn something from that, there's something to be said. And of course, I also shared the seven essences idea. So my blood pressure at the start was something like 180 over like 90, very high blood pressure, no medication eventually dropped to 114 over 66, and then 109 over 64. And I think today it's like something like 100 over 62. And I'm in my 60s, so people are like, what do you do for a living? Do you meditate? Like, what's, what's going on? You know, and they're pretty surprised. So the final slide on this is success at age four is not peeing your pants. And then you can go down the list, and at age 80, success is not peeing in your pants, right? I mean, it's pretty much a cycle there, right? It's a, it's a real cycle there that plays out. So before we go to what I would say is the provocative uh, statement or the provocation and the reason for having both Dr. Bortz as well as Dr. Hayflick here, I want to play at least part of this video because it's very provocative. There's a gentleman named... Dr. David Sinclair at Harvard. In fact, uh, Wally invited him for some class here at Stanford years ago, right? So I'm gonna tell you how I came to learn of his work. So I've been, because of Healthy 100 Years, the nonprofit, and because of the goal of trying to figure out what can we fund to sort of help medicine make this transition, just like we're trying to get law to make the transition, I've been reading a lot of books about aging, starting really with Dr. Bortz's dad's book about creative aging, because that is like the first major book on the topic. And what I've done, and this is just a little trade secret, you could call it that, as a result of learning how to extend myself yoga and biking and swimming, I bought myself a set of earphones that go outside your ears. They're sort of like, um, they go against the side of your head. They, they're called like skull phones. So I ride the bike while listening to books on tape. So this is like a two for one, because you're listening to a book on tape while you're riding a bike. Now you can even get these earphones while swimming so you can actually listen to a book on tape while swimming. Although my head is not oriented towards that because when you do a flip turn, the, headphones come off, it doesn't work for me, and I do the lengthy swimming. So I've been listening to books on tape, and because I'm interested in aging, these topics get pitched to me. So David Sinclair's latest book got pitched to me by Audible, and immediately I was like all over it. And as a result of getting that book, I said, I've got to bring some quotes of that book into this room, because there's some provocative stuff in that book 
about how maybe we can solve aging as though it's a disease and as though there's a cure for it. Very provocative statement. I said, I've got to get those quotes into the room because I've got to pitch those to both Wally and Len and see what they think about that because I think fundamentally you both believe, but I'll let you say it, that there are fundamental laws of physics that trump the biological processes, even if you could reverse the biological processes of aging. There's laws of physics that make even automobiles that are made out of stainless steel eventually deteriorate over time. So let me just play this video for a few minutes and just listen carefully because there's a lot of provocative stuff on here. And I think hopefully we'll, we'll get the gist of the background to the questions I'm gonna assert that Wally and Len should weigh in on. This one looks old, but they were born on the same day. They're the same calendar age. How is this possible? In recent years, aging researchers figured out how to accelerate the age of a mouse to make it grow older faster. But they can reverse aging symptoms in mice too. We have a molecule that we put in their water called NN, and the, the muscles appear younger and they can run further. They get new blood vessels, they have more blood flow. These are old mice becoming numb, put in a a week or so. Anti-aging molecules that work in mice don't necessarily work in humans, but this is already generating a lot of buzz as a way to extend our healthy lifespan. So what does emerging science tell us about our future longevity? How might we be able to stop, slow, or even reverse aging? I'm diving in to try and reduce my inner age in this future you with me, the least you. First, I got my blood drawn and sent off for analysis. I wasn't allowed to shoot in the lab. Sorry you couldn't see it. It was just a needle going in my arm and the blood came out and it filled three tubes. Then I went to Boston to get my results at a company called Inside Tracker. They use a handful of biomarkers like blood glucose and vitamin D to predict lifespan. They had bad news for me. You look great, and, uh, uh, but in, from the inside you have some issues. So according to this, I'm super old, or I'm like way older <laughs> than at my chronological age of 37. I took these results to David Sinclair. It says invested in insight factor. He's an anti-aging researcher at Harvard. Here he is with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And on the same list of influential people as Beyonce. And this is his big idea. We should be treating aging like it's a disease something you can stop or even reverse. Before we go any further, I just want to say that Asian science is fast moving and super exciting, but can lead to a lot of hype. So we're going to be pausing this video throughout with some footnotes, and sometimes we'll come from this guy, Jay Oshansky. Absolutely delighted. He's an aging professor at the University of Illinois and the chief scientist at a biotech company. For our footnote guy. There really isn't the scientific evidence to back up uh, claims of exceptionally high life expectancies. But that doesn't mean that we should be excited about aging science and aging biology. Sinclair hopes that technological and biological interventions, like the ones developed in his lab, could help humans live decades longer than we do now. And that's the good, healthy kind of view. Well, legally, based on studies in the lab for about 20 years in mice mainly, that aging uh, can be changed. That you can change the age of forwards and backwards, and make them move on. The interventions that you're talking about don't necessarily come in just being healthier and exercising better. You could actually take certain pills, is that right? Well, yeah, I mean, the best thing right now is to exercise and right. be hungry a little bit. What we're working on are uh, what would be pills that can be taken to augment you know, a healthy lifestyle that we all, of course, uh, You've been a pill isn't here yet. The medicine that the mice got is just being tested now in humans. Well, we're not mice, uh, and we don't react the same way as other organisms to uh, a, a potential therapeutic intervention. So it's premature uh, for any of this to enter into the world of uh, medicine and public health yet, but it doesn't mean it won't in the future. So here's a primer on how this anti-aging molecule could affect how aging works. 
when cells divide, they should make clean copies of themselves. But as we get older, genetic damage happens, and cells kind of lose their identity. The copies aren't as clean as leading to aging signs, like gray hair, or weaker joints, or even known killers, like cancer. Geneticists believe we can extend lifespan by preserving that cellular information as it passes on to new cells. One way we know we can do this is by stressing out our cells a little bit with exercise or eating less. Because when we exert ourselves or go a little hungry, our cells produce more of a molecule called NAD in our genes. NAD is a fuel for something called sirtuins. Sirtuins are like emergency responders for DNA. They help repair genes when they get damaged. That's where the molecule NMN comes in. It's a booster that our bodies convert to NAD. The NAD puts sirtuins to work, preventing cellular information loss. The effect? Cleaner copies of cells, which Sinclair hopes could help our bodies stay younger for longer. So to try and not be 50, since I'm not, I called up longevity doctor and oncologist Dr. Peter Atiyah. Hey, I can see you. Okay, perfect. How are you feeling? Great, how are you? Awesome. He prescribed me a regimen to reverse my age the old-fashioned way with diet, exercise, sleep, and more meditation. The NMN molecule isn't available in any FDA-regulated drugs right now. Full disclosure, Sinclair is an investor and advisor to pharma companies that are testing it. But the supplement industry is selling NMN and other NAD boosters already. Dr. Atia is studied up on which ones he feels are safe. Yeah, probably about a quarter of my patients are supplementing some form of NAD precursor. The supplement industry is pretty loosely regulated, and therefore you can't always be sure that what somebody says is in there is, is actually in there. And truthfully, my intuition is that most of them are crap. I think there are others that are at least legitimately making what they're saying they're making. I took the NMN that Dr. Atia instructed. Here it goes. Kind of sweet, kind of chalky. And for six weeks, I also did all the old fashioned things to stay young. Eat less, both less food and with time restricted feeding. I'm very hungry, but I cannot eat until noon. Sleep more, cover by, meditate more, and run. I think I'm carrying too much stuff while I'm running. <laughs> Like you. I kept doing this before I got another blood draw to see if I decreased my internal age. But before the big reveal, let's talk about where this technology could take us in 2050. In the year 2050. Given the aging research you have been involved in, how will we become superhuman uh, by 2050? Well, one way it could happen is with uh, this reprogramming. Technology. Reprogramming our cells. Listen up, this is wild. Reprogramming our cells really is beyond the anti-aging molecules being tested now. So this is really early days. So it could be like this, where you break your spine, you break your neck, you cut your face, and then you turn on the reprogramming and you feel like you're a newborn. That, that we're already doing in life, so we're restoring vision. And we don't know where it's going, but by 2050, we're gonna be able to restore a lot of things that get damaged. But where are ways that can go wrong? How do things get worse for the world if we're all living 120, 130 years old? Can the planet uh, sustain this many people living this long? Uh, well, if we all live forever, that's not going to work. So we'll have to find a new planet. Another, another bad scenario is we have a lot of people around just taking up uh, jobs and politicians who will stay in power for centuries. That, that's concern. Yeah, I'm, I'm mostly worried that the economy is going to grow to keep the number of jobs. What's it for? What are the ethics that need to be So one of the, the ethical issues is who can afford these medicines. If they're all very expensive, then we have a disparity where the rich are living 20, 30 years uh, than the rest of us. Okay, David Sinclair, what is super likely to happen by 20? Well, in, in 2050, we should have medicines that allow us to live another 10 or 20 years of healthy life. If reprogramming works, well, we can those reset organs and replace them, then we could live a lot longer than that. Okay, big reveal. Did my hard work pay off? Could I reduce my internal age? Results review. Oh yes, my inner age has dropped. After all this work, five years. <laughs>
She's 37 years old in real life, so she's still seven years older than her chronological age. I'm still older than my calendar age, but at least this process is over and I'm gonna go eat some glucose. Also, I should mention that if you wanna see this full series, you should go to NPR's YouTube page, youtube.com slash NPR, or npr.org slash future you. This is my cat Caesar. Caesar. Caesar stick pain. What's it like being an old man? You feeling it in your joints? See, look at him, he's hobbling. I'm gonna start giving you some NMN. <laughs> So I wanted to play that even though it went a little longer than what I remembered it going because when I started my journey a couple of years ago. Stay tuned for part two of this episode of The Valley Current.